All right, my verse might be weak. Suprema, su, su, Suprema roll call. 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 I'm out of ideas. Yeah. I'm so afraid. Yeah. yeah. Somebody help. Yeah. yeah. I ain't too proud to bring roll call. <laughs> Suprema, su, su, Suprema roll call. Remix play is next. Don't play it. <laughs> Suprema roll call. My name is Fonte. Yeah. I ain't trying to be funny. Yeah. If I'm just gonna keep it real. Yeah. I like must be the money. Roll call. <laughs> Suprema. Oh. Su su Suprema roll call. Suprema. Su su Suprema roll call. My name is Sugar. Yeah. And I got my booster. Yeah. So I could be here. Yeah. With this great producer. Roll call. Suprema. Su su Suprema roll call. Dallas Austin's music yeah. has changed my life. Roll call, Suprema, so su, su, Suprema, roll call, Suprema, su, su, you a Suprema, hit it. roll call. My name is Dallas, yeah. yeah. I'm here for show, yeah. yeah. I'm with Cuss Love, yeah. yeah. Gonna give you some more. Roll call, Suprema, su, su, Suprema, Suprema, roll call, Suprema, su, su, Suprema, roll call, Suprema. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Questlove. That's Fonte. Yeah. That's Laia. Uh -huh. And that's uh, uh, Sugar Steve. Yeah. And unpaid bills somewhere on Sesame Street. Um, you yeah. Look, I could take 12 minutes. Look, look ain't you proud to be? Creek. <laughs> Just one of them days. Before you walk out my life. Hat to the back. Yeah. Hit him up style. Yeah. Yeah. Aisha. Ooh. Yeah. I, I like the way you do. Yo, I, Sammy got like a... a yeah, 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 he's super weird now, right? Yeah, dog, I, I was not ready for that because he still has a baby face. Um, uh, Troops, I Will Always Love You. The fucking... Um, oh, I love that. Motown Philly. Yeah. Must be Please the money. Go, must be the money. Uh, yo. Get the must be the money. Playground. The Beyonce. Playground. Oh. Where'd you get that little squeaky thing? Never mind, I'm going to ask you all your production. Yeah. Just know that this show is more about the creative process. Yeah. Uh, uh, please don't go away Man, from me. Oh, well, I'll be yeah. there. My baby's got a secret. <laughs> Yo, I need some justice. I need some justice for Silly Ho. I think yeah. that, that got... Uh, yeah. That yeah. got <laughs> drafted. I'm sorry. The boys mind. They don't care about us. It's down around. What, all that shit. <laughs> I have so many questions about Too Bad, man. Yeah. Oh, fuck, I, man, yo, yeah. I was two seconds year old. I, I could have sworn I remember when I brought Tasty, and I was like, "Oh damn, okay, Pharrell and Chad, y'all, y'all, y'all hooking up. Y'all get more mature with the joint." I didn't know he did trick me. Yeah, Dog. that's one of my favorite joints. Dude, <laughs> I'm pretty. What about I can Aww. go on? What about your friends, yeah. ladies and gentlemen? This doesn't happen often. It's going to be a super producer episode. One of the greatest producers just. How do you get here? We don't know. <laughs> Did he do that song too? This is literally know. no. I'm sorry. I'm I, I, I would normally do oh. all these long accolades take 12 minutes, but you know, that's for the seven hour Jimmy Jam episode. Yeah. You lucky. Oh yeah. Let's get oh. to the smoke. He's definitely about to do five hours. He just don't know it yet. Anyway, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, please walk out. <laughs> Looking at Charlotte's like <laughs> right. This like no, he not. He out on the clock. That's where I'm rushing. Yeah. Ladies and yeah. gentlemen, Dallas Austin is with us. Yeah. Of course, love supreme. Yes, yes, yes. We are here, and uh, and this is our Atlanta series, and uh, we we've been here for a while. I'm yeah. Just wearing the same clothes every for five weeks. <laughs> okay. Shout out to Soundbite Studio. Yes, shout out to Sound. Thank you, uh, you, uh, you. Uh, <laughs> Soundbite Studio. Yeah, yeah. You, I was saying you kind people, but it almost you clown people. Because <laughs> you're moving fast, you're moving fast. You got, you got I know, records. Just, you got I feel the pressure. <laughs> I feel the pressure. Put me in. Um, how how are you, Mr. Austin? I'm good, man. I'm I'm really good. I gotta say, uh, the day that we're speaking is the 26th anniversary of the Illadelph Half Life release, of which the very song we worked on was at Darp Studios. Yeah, we did Panic and started. Episodes at DARP. Yep. 
we were just we and we cold knocked. I think we just knocked and was like, you know, can we get a studio room real quick? And all I remember was um, you were there recording the the Fishbone record. Yep. And Joy was there too. And this is the first time that I saw. Um, uh, I'm, I'm drawing a blink right now. Uh, the lead singer of Fishbone. Um, uh, Angelo. Uh, Angelo. Angelo. This is, well, he was very much in love with that Thurman. Oh, my God. Dog. If you, if you can hear, if you can hear <laughs> his obsession with the Thurman, if you can hear, it, like, if I had the stems to panic on Tariq's vocal track, you can still hear, like, the bleeding through the wall. <laughs> That's my memories of, of of dark, but no, thank you very much for doing this with us, man. And we couldn't, I didn't know what to do with that thing. It was like, you couldn't control the theremin. So, and he was just, he was determined to use it on the record. It was almost impossible to put it in tune. Dude. And that's what bleed, bleeding over into the sessions. Dude, wow. <laughs> like he would just be in the hallway and like, it, it was like he was doing a, a Cairo Rivera, like, <laughs> that's just for like four hours straight. Um, you're, your your legacy runs deep, so we're just going to dive right into it. What was your first musical memory? Well, um, when my stepdad played for James Brown, who was Jimmy Nolan. And, oh, wow. Um, Dang, Jimmy Nolan. Shank Nolan is... Here we go. This ain't going to be short. Motherfucker. That's the show. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I would, this is crazy. So I would wake up with him. Um, Jimmy Shank Nolan? Yeah. Does Wendy Melvoin know this? Does Chris... I don't know. <laughs> Have you ever mentioned this? I don't know if I've mentioned to Wendy before. But every morning, I would wake up in third grade and um, play guitar with him. And he would teach me to play with my, my, my fingers like this. Think it, think it, think it, think it, you know. And um, I, would, I would smoke a little bit of a joint and then go to school. <laughs> because it was, it was, you know, 70s and stuff. So my mom, my mom owned a, a, um, a nightclub in, in Columbus, Georgia. And during the 60s, um, um, it was segregated. So that when Tina Turner, James Brown, anybody came to town, they had to come perform, you know, in my dad's party club, stay in that area, eat in the soul food restaurant that's right there. And, you know, so I came up kind of in the, in the nightclub restaurant business first. And there's a lot of 70s, you know, wannabe bands and Blue Shack carpet and clavinet horners. And, you know, so my mom doing books, I'm running around playing on the equipment every day. And Jimmy would be on the road. And whenever he would come back, then I would sit and play guitar with him. And then I would go on the road with the JBs, like when I was like, when I was like, <laughs> Seven. Oh well, that um, explains everything. Like, this right. literally, this <laughs> thank you. This, this literally <laughs> took every question out of my head. I'm still fucked up that I'm sitting next to someone that knew Jimmy Chink Nolan. Yeah, man. Like Hurlin Cheese and Jimmy Chink Nolan are, I mean, the 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 wonder twins of syncopated rhythm. They're just, and, you know, and I don't know why their timing uh, 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 was. I don't know why my mom. You know, I, I was just so so into music. You know, I was so crazy about music. But uh, yeah, I went on the road with the JBs one summer, and um, I think I was like seven or eight. I was real little, and I rode the bus with them the whole time. And me, Sweet Charles, uh, wow. Sinclair, Maceo. You knew these people. I would be yeah, I would be under they the organ him. while while Sweet him. Charles was rehearsing. Right while they're practicing, I would be under the organ playing with cars or like you know playing on little pianos and stuff. And this is how, how crazy this is that it goes full circle. Um, so. Uh, and Catherine Bruton had a, a thing at BMI when she right. first got to BMI. She said, we're going to honor James Brown. And we want um, you, Pharrell, Chad, Rodney Jerkins, all y'all going to be the JBs. Wow. Not knowing your connection. Pharrell got on drums and started playing. Pharrell was uh, doing drums. Uh, what it is is what it, it is. Yo, what he is called is me the night is. before <laughs> and said, yo, I'm about to do Mind Power with James Brown. Yes, <laughs> yes. This is that night? This is that night. Ah. So we all in rehearsal and... Um, for one, everybody was like, that's going to be impossible to get them together. So we all in rehearsal doing it. What it is is what it is. I'm playing the same chinky notes I was playing in third grade, right? You know, I'm like, this right. is getting surreal. This is giving me a trip, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so by the time we hit the stage with James, um, and I didn't, you know, I, I was little, so I didn't know how much he remembered me or not or followed my history of music or not. But as soon as he saw me on the stage, he goes to me, and that's Jimmy Nolan's boy right there. And then he started talking about how he knew me since I was little. He used to see me under the organ and wow. all this kind of stuff. And, um, but it was a trip going on the road with them because um, I remember this, this one time where, you know, they were all lined up. The band was the JBs, and then um, and James was in the dressing room getting ready to come out, and they out there just talking, doing their thing, you know, smoking cigarettes, talking trash, whatever. And this dude comes out <laughs> and he walks out and he slaps the hell out of all of them. Bow, bow, bow. 
and I was so terrified. I didn't know what to do. I was just like, what just happened? You know what I'm saying? All of a sudden, it was just like, and he walked right through and went straight to the stage, and then they went to the stage and started playing. And so afterwards, you know, as a kid, you're still just like in your own version of shock. Like, what, what just happened, right? Um, <laughs> so he, um, and Jimmy said to me, he said, man, you know, he, he, he does that to get our attention. It's almost Is like that the face? I'm sorry, when you say slap in the, the face? face? Yeah, yeah, it was. What? You know, if you feel like, you know, Shit. get your attention off the bat. If you feel like you're playing too much or you're not serious about what's about to happen, you don't know what he'll do. He'll leave you. If somebody messed up, he'll leave the whole band. You can, like, right. He wasn't playing, so he. Wait, you can you smack know, motherfuckers. Yeah, well, back, no then, back then you could. Yeah, right. Nobody, nobody the internet back then, but yeah, it was um, it, it was part of what really started me, started shaping me into playing. You know, so I started on guitar, mm -hmm. and then the guitar started hurting my fingers, so I started playing keyboards, mm -hmm. and then from that point I was just. You, and you know, all self-taught, like no formal lessons or none of that. Self-taught by Casio. Started with the Casio calculator, and then asked my mom to get me a big one every Christmas, and then I uh, worked my way up to it. Roland JX 3P. Oh, okay. oh, you went to the big boys. Well, it took I me a while. I stopped at the SK ones. See, I was at the SK ones, <laughs> but I couldn't play in the local bands, and if I didn't have a keyboard for real, a real keyboard, right? Yeah. So my my brother financed it. Was twelve hundred dollars. He financed it for five years. Wow. <laughs> so, he played wow. ten thousand dollars for that. Yeah. He would sneak me in concerts, like because my mom's restaurant in Columbus was down the street from the auditorium. Then I went to every concert. So I seen the Mothership Land. That was one of my first concerts. Yeah, tell me like, about the concerts yeah. you saw when you were a kid. That, that's one of the first ones because I said, Mom, you know, George Clinton, they're coming to town and Parliament Funkadelic and the roof is going to open up and the spaceship's going to come in. And she said, well, honey, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> I, I said, you didn't see the commercials? Look at the commercial on TV. The, the spaceship's coming in. I got to see this. So she's like, all right, but I just don't want you to be disappointed. <laughs> you know? right. So I go to the concert. My brother would always take me to the concerts. He would sneak me in with a snare drum that was mine from school, like saying it was for Zap's drummer. And, you know, Smart. <laughs> yeah, my brother was always, everybody was in, we were all in music. So, you know, and um, so when I, when I got to the concert and I'm watching the show and all of a sudden they start doing the swing down, sweet cherry stop. And I'm like, here it comes, here it comes, it's going to open up. But, and I didn't realize as a kid how it was happening, but I know the spaceship came down on the stage. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was just like blown away from it and all the costumes and watching Bootsy and watching like the whole, you know, I was able so to see. You every actually concert. got to see uh, Glenn Goins call down the motion. You heard I've seen the sing. whole thing, bro. Yeah. Like the, the the same one you can watch on the old 70s film yeah, if you see yeah. it. And when George comes out with the whole cane uh -huh, and the, and the hat, the and, you know. Yeah. And um, I, the thing about my mom's restaurant was that I was able to meet all these people. Before I ever ever worked with them or knew them, so they would come to the restaurant afterwards. They would or? go before and eat because a soul food restaurant, and then that was the closest restaurant to the venues, the venue to the auditorium. It was only one place. So every time these Roger, Zap, mm -hmm. Lionel Richie, Commodores, Earth, Wind, and Fire, all these people, I seen them when I was little in my mom's restaurant. Did you ever? Is there ever a circle back to some of these? Folks oh yeah, now? and they like you like remember all of when them. I was a little boy. So especially George. Okay. Um, you know George has been. Uh, you know, since I started Dark, since the times you were there, George mm -hmm. was around then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's when he was really starting to hang around us. He at, worked at on Dark. Hollywood, right? I yep, I did Hollywood. Um, but him, Lionel Richie, all of them. I, about, I got a chance, Natalie Cole. They must be so proud of oh, you. Wow. Like, damn. Yeah, that, it was. A, it's a full circle trip. You know, what I was your, a lot what of was your favorite uh, Parliament album? Parliament people in that. I was like, I really like, I was, I was in the Cosmic Slops album first, like with Maggot Brain, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you know, just because my brothers and them was just playing right. over and over and over how, again. How much older were your brothers than you? Like five years, you know, so like. Are you the middle or are you the baby? I'm the baby. Okay, okay. So. Wait, you're um, the baby? Yeah. I, I thought my, my, that my, the, my, who's the hype man for uh, uh, another back creation? G.A., that's oh, my, no. yeah, yeah, that's my nephew. G.A., that's right. <laughs> I thought that I was your brother. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought that was your brother. That's your nephew. That's okay. right. Actually, my cousin, my aunt's son. That so. was like an urban legend when we was younger. Like, you know this? Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah all, all of us was down in Columbus, man. And then um, and then my, my brother, who brought the keyboard, ended up breaking my... I was playing Get It Up one day from the time. Over and over and over and over again, because that's how we learned how to play. Right. And my brother came in one day, said, Mom, said, clean up the room. And I wasn't listening, so he picked the keyboard up, threw it, broke it. I tripped out, flipped, went, tried to. My mom's restaurant was connected to the the house we stayed in at that at that time. Uh -oh. So it was like soul food restaurant in downtown Columbus. So everything was going down, like everything was going down, um, and it was just bad. It was just just dark. And so um, he broke your keyboard, the one he paid for. Yeah, 
And I, I tried to kill. Him. I tried to kill him. <laughs> no, this is. <laughs> but I was so little. You know, when you're little, you don't know better. So you know, I ran downstairs. My mom restaurant, get a knife, run upstairs, and I'm crying. My mom, what was going on? And because that keyboard was the only thing that got me into bands with people that was like bigger. You know, like mm-hmm. Kevin Bradshaw and them, who ended up being like Basic Black. They had oh, bands. Wow. You know, so I wanted to play in the band and, and be like Dr. Fink for real, like Jimmy Jam for real. And now you just ruined my dream. So. And how old are you now? Are you talking about that? Twelve. Okay. Oh, Speaking of which, uh, we found this out recently that Prince initially wrote "Get It Up" for yeah. Brick. For Brick? They didn't like it. Oh my Morris god. Morris just laid it on us on his episode. Oh that. my god. I was a, I was a straight up fanatic. I was a Prince time fanatic. I was such a fanatic that that's how I t- learned to play everything because I would right. go home every day. And learn get it up solo. I'll go home every day and learn cool. Go home every day and all just be like words. girl and all that and all this all all this stuff. And I was so little that, you know, you just sat there and did it over and over and over and over and over again. And by the time I got to be twelve, you know, I was really good. By the time we broke my keyboard, that's what made me move to Atlanta. Cause uh. I told my mom, I was like, yo, cause it's a Greyhound bus station around the street. Mm-hmm. So after he broke my keyboard, I went to that bus station. I'm like, I'm going to Atlanta. But you're 12, so yeah. I don't understand how that. Well, she didn't either at first. Okay. <laughs> so you, <laughs> you ran away. With, you you announced that you're running away from home. We all do oh, that, yeah. but and not then, to the bus but, station. But Could they stop you? I, I went to the bus station. I'm waiting on the bus. Like I'm, 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 And it's late at night, so my mom is like, yo, what are you doing? Like, I'm, He broke my keyboard. I can't be a big producer. I got to get to Atlanta. And she was like, what? And what like, you get into in Atlanta for? Because at the time, because my Atlanta's auntie, different. but my auntie lived up here, and it was still not there. And I knew something else could happen here. Okay, okay. you know, like you still had Brick, and you still had Cameo, and you still had SOS Band, and like, mm-hmm. you know, Atlanta rhythm sections, and all this stuff was going on back but then. But in your mind, like, at least if I'm 12, you know what I knew of Atlanta, pre, like when Bobby Brown came down, then I was like, okay, something's about to happen. But before then. The only person I knew that like bragged about Atlanta back then was Peebo Bryson. Peebo Bryson and but, Cameo. Right, but I didn't know even yeah. th- like not even reading the labels. Like uh, you know, I'm just saying that. Why? Again, you're 12, so I'm glad you kind of went next door instead of like you New know, York, 2,000 miles away. <laughs> <laughs> why was New York or Hollywood not on your? radar because i've been to atlanta um we would come up on the weekends and, and they had the biggest music store like rhythm city or something was called and mm-hmm. like so you look at the yellow pages and it was like that was the closest dream i could see for real you know it was like if i get up there i can go to the music shops i can do this i can do that um but i just knew that columbus wasn't the place for it and so my mom came the next day she came and said look okay it's late at night i know you're stubborn i know you're mad just come on back to the house and we talk about it. And no buses are leaving tonight anyway. So, <laughs> you know, come on back home. It's fine. We can we'll, we can deal with it tomorrow. So I went back home. Woke up the next day. Was he there? Oh <laughs> yeah, no, he was going drinking Budweiser's by then. He was like, <laughs> he was, okay. He you know that he he realized at that point how you know what had happened. Right. And so um, the next day I got up during the daytime. I went down to my mom's cash register in the, in the restaurant. He got me like twenty forty bucks. I went back to the Greyhound bus station. And then uh, now it's full on. Now it's daytime. The buses are leaving. And so she comes back around again. And she's like, yo, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm going to Atlanta. I can't I can't stay down here. Dude broke my keyboard. And all my brothers are like, you know, in jail a lot. Like we had a lot of just jail and darkness. So it's me and my mom are really close. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, absolutely and not repairable at all? It, it was repairable. It just didn't look like it. Right. Because <laughs> okay. you're 12. The two, the, two first, the two keys came off the beginning. You know, oh, the, oh you mean the c- keyboard. I thought you meant the relationship. The relationship. My bad. Oh, no, what, what, relationship? oh, yeah, that too. Oh, oh the keyboard. <laughs> no. Well. Well, then, you know, my mom was like, well, look, if you're that determined, you're that stubborn, then give me some time to sell the restaurant. I'm going with you. You're not leaving me. Wait, time oh, out. Wow. That's dope. She's yep. willing to do that for you? She did that. That's your best friend for real. And that's how I got to Atlanta. So she came up, sold the restaurant. My dad was really, he was really prominent in Columbus. He did a lot of stuff with the city, did a lot of stuff with the streets and, you mm-hmm. know, gangsters and all this stuff. He was just that guy. So, you know, I was just like, nothing's down here for us except for, legacy that he left and some problems with police and all this kind of stuff let's just go and so we left came to atlanta she got a job at po folks on old national i moved to college park po folks. and she she didn't even know how much money to ask for because she was always self-employed right. in a little restaurant and um so she started making twelve thousand a year and i started going to school sometimes <laughs> how long was that period between the bus station and y'all actually moving about 
about it, almost eight, like eight months to a year. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, that's good. She like time when she was like, all right, let me situate yeah. it. Let me figure it out. Where am I going to work? How Let's do I sell plan. this? How do I, you know, um, because my father, he, he, he got killed in front of us when he was two, when I was two. Right. Because he. What? Yeah. He had his, his nightclub and his restaurant and this dude had a dream or something. And he was a friend of his that that my uncle beat him with a pipe or something crazy, but just some craziness. And he came down to shoot my uncle at the restaurant. My dad was standing in the door. So he shot him first and then came in where I was playing with my uncle, came in and shot my uncle and then jetted. So, I mean, they called him. He went to jail, but then my, my dad didn't end up making it. My mom had to take over the club and take over the responsibility of the nightclub and the uh, restaurant. Now, the nightclub is full of all the politicians I know now in Atlanta, <laughs> pimps, streets, hustlers, Gene Griffin, like yeah. all the, you know. That, that Gene that, Griffin? That Gene Griffin was part of my growing up, too, with my dad. What was Gene Griffin exactly besides a name that always was in Teddy Riley's place? place? My God. Gene. I don't know what he looks like. <laughs> I just know that I've seen his name a lot. Gene Griffin was one of the most notorious like, gangsters back then. He was the Shug of? Oh, Beyond. They wasn't playing. Him and uh, Bill Underwood, who was connected to Johnny Gill okay. you know, out of New York. They had they had New York on lock. That was back in the, in the you know. Like Post Frank Lucas, Frank Lucas days. Okay, that was all during that time. So was Atlanta his base, and he would work out in New York, or was New York his base? And then I got well, some shit down south too. Co- Columbus and New York was his base, so they would take it from New York to Columbus, and then distribute out through Georgia, Atlanta, and every, everywhere else. Um, heroin, coke, whatever they were they were doing. And so we knew Gene Griffin when I, when I was little. I knew Gene from being married to my auntie and being a gangster, and them showing up with mink coats on and mink hats and Maseratis and, you know, guns and just the whole 70s, you know, what, you, what you're doing at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't until, so Gene went to jail right, for, for a long time, and during that time, Andre got Teddy and God. But, but, but Teddy was already signed to Gene before that with kids at work. Okay. Mm-hmm. So when he got out, he came out saying, hey, I want my guy, I want my, I want my producer back. So it was a little episode with him and Andre because cause they were in Guy, and he didn't want to give him Guy. Right. So Joe Busby was like, yo, okay, let's stop the turmoil. You take Teddy. Guy stays over here with us, and then we'll – so that's how Teddy ended up being producing with Gene. Ah, so he wouldn't let him go. Now check this out. My mom's at work at Po' Folks one day, mm-hmm. right? Now I'm up here. Um, I did Hey Mr. DJ with, with Joyce Irby by then, mm-hmm. so now I'm not like my 16, you know. I got my first Wait, time out. You out. did that at 16? Yeah. Wow. Wait, was that you wearing the Batman shirt on Soul Train? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, long story. <laughs> but uh, I was also in some, got into some contracts with her that would work for higher contracts. Mm. But she was the first one to really get me to Cheryl Busby and to doing Troop and to doing stuff like that at that age. Um, but I found out it was I was in some work for higher contracts that wasn't good contracts, right? And so one day, my mom's at work at Poe Folks. And she gets a call from Gene Griffin. Okay. Oh, Lord. And she's like, she don't understand. Mm-hmm. Right? Because the Gene Griffin that she knows was in jail, was gangster, mm-hmm. was running with my dad and him back then. So she knows that Gene, but she had no idea. So he's like, Bill, I got to get in touch with Dallas. He, he, he needs to understand I'm doing music. And she's like, what? And then she calls me and says, oh, no, Dallas. Gene Griffin call. <laughs> <laughs> I said, who? She said, Gene Griffin. What do he want with you? I said, I don't know. What, what, what do you want with me? She said, I don't know. He said something about Teddy Riley. And I said, oh, wait. Because I was always seeing Gene Griffin's name, but I didn't know it was him. Right. Yeah. I thought it was somebody else. So you didn't put two Teddy. and two together? No. Okay. And then when I did, I'm like, oh, man. So I called him. He's like, yo, if your dad knew I was letting you out, be out here like that, he'd turn over in his grave. Boy, I got to come and protect you. You know, so it turned into, <laughs> into that. And so then he, he they moved to Atlanta. Right. Right, and then Teddy, you know him. He was the first one, really, like, you know, getting Teddy, a hundred thousand dollars a track was unheard of. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Getting yeah, producers that much money was mm-hmm. just insane. He was first. Teddy was the first one getting that kind of money, real money, uh, because because of Gene, you know. Okay. And what he did that was really smart was he he was trying to when Teddy got really big, what he did was he did production deals everywhere, but he never did a label deal, right? Mm-hmm. So he could keep putting them at different places. Mm-hmm. Well, Gene owned. Uh, Sony Music. It's called Sounds of New York. Right? I was wondering how that... I, I remember when Teddy... Because remember he had Today? That, yes. Do you really want him? Right, right, right. Today, that was on Sounds of New York. 
Right. Wow. I was wondering how Sony allowed that to happen. The they Japanese didn't. Show. That's yeah. why they came in and, and disrupted him and Teddy and everything else because, you know, he had the rights to Sony Music because it sounds in New York. And right. so they were Columbia back then. Okay. And so he was so disruptive with everything he was doing though at the time. He was like, should. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, um, and so, but he was, he was real, real with it. So, you know, they, they kind of wanted to separate him and Teddy and get Teddy away from under him. And so people Is this why Teddy moved to Virginia? That's why Teddy moved to Virginia. That's why they. But in, does that stop a cat like Gene? Like, if Gene is Atlanta, New York, and that, like, well, Gene, I can easily get to well, Virginia well, Beach. Well, he, 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 you know, he was still, it was, a, it was a dispute, but they're still getting money. But then Gene said, okay, fuck it, I'm going to go to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And I, he started Basic Black to be his new guy, remember? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that started up. But by the time, you know, he's he's Gene. He's rolling in all the Teddy Riley money anyway. Um, now, can can we assume that uh, Hey DJ was your, Hey Mr. DJ was your first debut as a producer? Yeah, I mean, I did a couple of little things before that, but that was the first one to get on a know, national level. Yeah, and then Dougie Fresh said my name in his record. I thought I was just gonna die. He's like, "Yo, Dallas, it's time to rock." And, right. And I was in, uh, I was in Mul on Mulholland in some rental car at like sixteen, seventeen, with working with Joyce, and I heard it on the radio, and I heard my name, and I was like, "God, this is it. This I've been waiting to do this all my life." And then, so, and then every time from that point, I had a record. I would go to Mulholland to the same spot. And, listen and to test it there, yeah. like really, <laughs> yeah. The magic spot, the magic spot. What so, year were you uh, recording on at that time to make that Joyce Fenderella review? Dude, album? it was a RX. It was the Yamaha drum machine that just came out with back then. Yeah, and it did, it sounded really thin. It, it I was gonna really say like, when you get to the bridge, <laughs> like I, when I remember the song, like the the verse was high powered, yep. and the chorus is high powered. But then when y'all get to the bridge, it's almost like a, a, a sonic difference <laughs> without the samples and all that stuff on top of it. So I had to, uh, and you know, back then sampling you can only sample this long, right? So it's only like clap to this, uh, 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 one, two, James Brown. That's only that's all the sample link that you had. So right. it's going to clap to this, clap, clap, clap to this, <laughs> over and over. But it was like you know, it was the closest thing to swing at the time to New Jack Swing. And then when Gerald Busby heard that, he said, uh. Yo, man, I got this group uh, that I want you to work with, but I don't think uh, I don't think Joyce should work on them with you. I think you should do it by yourself. Mm. I said, okay. He said, yeah, they call Boys the Men. He says, Mike Bivens group, um, but I think your influence is better without her, you know, because she would come mix the records and stuff too. So if right. you listen to like, I will always love you from Troop, it's a lot thinner to me than than other songs right. I was doing you, after your, that. Your trademark was there. Yeah, my drums ain't got thick your yet. My leg. <laughs> so I, I want to ask, uh, you know. For at least from my my point of view, like as a fan listening, like it was impossible, at least back then, 90, 91, to escape the bomb squad. Oh, my God. How influential. Because the thing is, is that this is, this is even though they did an awesome job on the P Poison record, which is basically like. 70, maybe 80% samples. Oh, yeah. And whatever. But, you know, I mean, a lot of the stuff is atonal. But, yeah. I mean, you just took that shit to the hilt. And I always wondered your level of just chaotic production <laughs> without without sort of a, a linear, um, melodic thing. Like, I, I mean, I, was, Hats it, at the Back is a great example. It, like, there really yeah. isn't a me melody there. So it's like when you're writing this stuff, and again, I know the chaotic form of production at the time, especially with like Teddy doing a more nuanced, steady New Jack Swing, you know, yeah. by the numbers thing. But yeah. you were just like the Wild Wild West with it. How hard was it for you to convince, not the acts, because I feel like you and the acts were like of the age and all that stuff, but like the Busbies of the world, like the older, I'm assuming these guys are at least four years old. Like, yeah. how do you convince them that cramming 42 gazillion samples in something is like that's what they want. It, it was, yeah, it was a lot of samples, bro. Like, I wanted to be I wanted to be in the Bomb Squad so bad with Hank Shockley and them. I was right. like, I was going down to Green Street, like, studios, and I'll see Mike Bivens and them working with them, and I was just like, man, the, the Bomb Squad, it was just so incredible how they would take all these samples that was just, like, just out of nowhere and make sure that they were out of tune and make sure that they had nothing to do with each other and make <laughs> right. sure they were so. So I would take that same formula, right? And I would, I would do that, but then I would write a regular song on top of it. Like, so if, think if I just took all that away and then write a song like Hat to the Back or write a What About Your Friends as a song. Because mm -hmm. I always knew that, like, 
your production is a vehicle, but you gotta have a song, you gotta and have you gotta cram that song into three minutes. You gotta mm -hmm. usually have two hours to tell it in a movie. You got like two minutes now, but three minutes back then to tell a story mm -hmm. in a song. So then, if you took all that away, you could hear the song. Like I, all the keyboards, yeah, all the, the strings, chords, yeah. everything's on there. Just like I had to ignore all the samples and don't think anything about them. Um, and so then, how hard is that if you have a singer that doesn't have like a, a something to and the something thing is like i'm hearing the it. final you know, like we're hearing the final mix yeah but i'm certain with like ain't too proud to be like it was just like not completely mixed and <laughs> it's so much noise in that song yeah. like right. radio wouldn't play it because it has so much noise in it at first it was, was like there was like it was, no but when you think way. about it it, is it a was lot like of... when they when they first took it to radio they were just like no it was like, what is this? No, it's too much noise. It's like it's just too much noise. And then she said she was saying two inches or yard rock hard. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That and was so the problem. So there was like, no. Yeah. Just no. And so then Lamont Bowles came back. Um, he used to work at the face, and he mm. was just like, you know what? They gotta see the girls first. Mm. Trying to tangle in through this. It's too there's too much noise. It's too they don't get it. It's too they like gotta this. see the whole oh, So they try to the white label so, it first and see what's yeah. up. And oh then. yeah, they went to radio first, like usual, but then radio was like, nah, uh uh, too much noise. The video. Yeah. And then when they shot the video, video and you saw, yo, Mike check one, two, one, two. It was we saw fun. the video, everybody was like, Oh, we get it now. And right. and that's what really set the girls off. Um and then but like having that many samples like okay, so you wasn't you it, sample clearances hadn't came in yet. It's kind of like the, right. like the blockchain. <laughs> it was like <laughs> sample clearances was like something that we all did. We all got a hold to it for fun now. We could do whatever we want. Nobody ever done that before. Nobody's ever taken somebody's song and, and then recorded it and sung something different on top of it. Right. Like they was doing remakes, but not that. That's when y'all was pissing off all the old heads. Everybody. And nobody knew how to clear it. Nobody. But your shit was so chaotic that it would take... Like one of us, our generation, to know like, oh, that snare came from there. That's but like, dude, okay, but look at it like this though. So if you got Fly Robin Fly, mm. right? right? Then you got the average white band, mm. and then you got Cool in the Gang, That's right? The song. And then you got Parliament, mm. right? That's and expensive. then you got now the thick. Okay, <laughs> it's thirty people in each, in each group, right? Right, right? So when they started to break down the sample clearances and say, okay, Ooh. we figured this out, we got to go back and get these people paid. Oh no. Oh, yeah. goodness. Yeah, I saw those credits. It ain't, it ain't but 100% oh, of the song. Oh, my God. Yeah. Like, 0.1% to the horn player. 0 one to this. Like, because you didn't realize that each one of those samples has so many people connected to it. Mm -hmm. And I, I would have, I would have like, 25, 25, 30 samples going across the board. And we just, like, mute out different ones at different times and whatever. But, like, it was... So it became crazy, and, and if you notice, by the time we got to the uh, the second record with Creep, it was just like just one straight, just like, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Rick, Rick. <laughs> but even Creep at that time Wait was still minute. it didn't sound like nothing else. Okay, I'm so glad you mentioned this, because that was the craziest story of my life. Where, and I'm talking about this the Shinehead situation. So I guess the story of Creep is, um, uh, rah, 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 uh hey young world, so. I guess Slick Rick never cleared the guess who's back Shinehead sample on Hey Young World. Oh, wow. 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 Guess, guess who's, who's back? back. Yeah. Right. So then you guys use that. And so Shinehead's people try to go after you guys for it. Yep. And you're like, no, we cleared Hey Young World. <laughs> Through Slick Rick. Yeah, like we cleared it. Here's the clearance. And they're like, yeah, but. Rick never cleared it with us. So can you explain that situation? Like how, yeah, that works. like did you wind up clearing Shinehead sample for Rick? for, for <laughs> Def Jam? They had to go back and sort, because again, at that time, nobody was, it, it was all new. And, you know, so they had to go back and pay him too. You know, they, Slick Rick, I mean, they had to go and situate him not being paid from not only that, but from Hey Young World too. Yeah, but I'm uh, saying like, did you guys have, have to, to pay him too? Pay, like, is, is Shinehead a first generational sample on creep or did you tell them at Def Jam like yo clear this shit the right way so that way well, our shit's straight yeah because when we cleared it through them and they cleared the, they cleared it then that's when he popped up and was like hold on but that's my you know right I thought it was Slick Rick I didn't even I, I thought it was so, yeah, exactly. I, I didn't pay attention exactly. to it I thought it was Dougie Fresh or Slick Rick or somebody saying guess who's back but I thought it belonged to the song um, and when they did come back and clear it then they had to go back and take care of him for not only that, but for f for Hey, young, hey young World, or what Hey Young World was going to generate coming up, you know, because <laughs> he's never gotten take care of for it because people didn't know how to clear samples back then. I thought they forced you to pay for both. As here's Shine Hit, this is for Creep, and then since they didn't do it, here's Hey Young World. Oh, oh yeah, like, no, Def Jam had to go take care of him. Whew, okay, 
Same thing happened uh, with Jay and Kanye for, uh, uh, I guess, if anyone makes any reference to any parts of the song that Aaron Fuchs owns on anything. So in the case of, of Otis, because Kanye and Jay said, Jay is chilling, Jay is mm-hmm. chilling, Stop what more, oh, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So Aaron Fuchs was like, <clears throat> hello, right. uh, Nat Robinson, they're sampling our song. Yep. And you know Nat and Milk D were like, no, that's that's like a sh- like rappers don't suit suit it's a each cadence, other, right? Like, it's... no, no, but yeah, yeah rappers yeah. just don't suit. Like you know, yeah. Premier scratches your shit. You think yeah. it's an honor, like, yeah, oh, yeah. he said. But litigious people, and I'm talking very official because mm-hmm. even when I talk about Did... AF, he tries to get litigious with me. <laughs> but <laughs> you know that was that was a semester situation. So yeah, I, I always wanted to know that Shinehead situation with Creep. I mean, what's crazy is, you know, when sampling came around like that, George Clinton obviously had, you know, the whole West Coast sound, period. Right. But mm-hmm. nobody knew how to clear it. And he had signed over so many different contracts to different people. Right. Back then, you know, he was just selling stuff and that on the road partying and not keeping up with anything. And nobody ever knew this was going to happen. Mm-hmm. Nobody ever knew that sampling would come around the corner and, and you know, change people's lives like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he had to get Cochran and them to try to help undo a lot of his stuff. Right. Cochran. Yeah, because wow. George Clinton samples between him and James Brown, they have to be the most. Right. I would yeah. think. Him. He just, just got his contractual financial thing straight. You like, know, I got. I have. I have a lot of the. I have the Funkadelic Masters to Cosmic Slot to Needy. Um, so you're friends with the Armand. Well, George gave them to me. Oh, okay. That well, yeah, he would. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> George gave them to me, um, and I had them bake. You know, that right. after the master's bake, but you can hear, like, <laughs> mm-hmm. when you go and you listen to each one of them, mm-hmm. it's just like you get chills because that moment is captured on that tape. You yeah. can hear them, you can hear them like, <laughs> something about music. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. I have a question, at least in in the, the mixing of it all, like during your chaotic period. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I would assume that probably of all your clients, Maybe TLC is probably your. I, I mean, I'm just assuming as a listener, your pride and joy, because at least with the yeah. journeys that y'all taken together with each record, yeah, I can feel like they get your prime ideas and all that stuff. So more than anyone else, like they're your, they're your, your My cherished idea? guinea pig. No, oh, TLC definitely. So that that said, um, when I spoke to Nick, uh, so Nick Santano who engineer the uh, public mm-hmm. enemy records he told me he said you'll never believe this but we never automate it once and i was like what what is the mixing process like and he's like you know keith yeah, that keith yeah. and eric were such sticklers well mainly to save money kind of in a way that when when mm. uh i forgot uh, ray parker jr told us that barry white never overdubbed because he didn't want to pay for overtime so like everyone played at once Yep. Uh, but Nixon Sano showed me the 911 bass head tracking sheets, and literally, like, they're like Eric Sadler's, like, you know, 81 bars cut off, da da da. So they would do everything ahead of time before tracking. Mm. Were you, or like, is that how you track your things, or like, is it just you drop it and then you mix it at the end, like everyone would, else does? I would drop it and mix it at the end, but like, okay. I would have, um, like, you know, Back at that time, the engineers like Dave Way, or like oh, you know, you, you'll find uh, Timmy Regisford was was okay. crazy mixing back then. But that was your main guy for TLC, or I would use Dave Way a lot back then because Teddy was using Dave Way. Okay, um, and then Alvin Spites, of course. Um, but it was they they they, they would have a, a fit at first. They'd be like, okay, give me a second <laughs> to figure <laughs> this out. Yeah, because I would have so many tracks and then so many samples. And how do you put the samples and embed it back in the track so that the chords stand out and so that the so the roughs would sound a lot different than when they were mixed because, um, you know, we take, unless I sat with them, you know, we kind of make the roughs and then, you know, you give them a sketch for the mixer. Mm-hmm. But if you just sent it to a mix engineer, he'd just be like, no, this is crazy. Were what you is working, this? Uh, was Leslie, was he mixing any of stuff? Not time? yet. He hadn't okay. came in yet. Um, Leslie? Leslie Brathwaite. Leslie Brathwaite. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, but Leslie went to, you know, he's at Full Sail, so he came in as an intern first. Mm-hmm. And then from that point, he just started going at it. Like, you know, he, I just knew that he was going to, get there you know so him coming in and then being my engineer my recording engineer 
And then I was working on Madonna's Secret when he did the rough mix to it. She was like, I like that mix better. Wow. And that's what kind of kicked off his, his like, mixing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Was it more, wait, mix, like, it would be completed? Or I was I was going to ask, are you a demo-itis person? Dude, or you know what? It's horrible. Or you're, like, or you're artist demo-itis. I, I, I learned to, I tried to, I tried to, at first I was horrible because I was a total demo-itis person. But then the whole first Boys the Man album, the two album, mm -hmm. that's all the rough mixes. Word? Slut? Yeah. Like, thank you. So all when, that, that's all. Well, that's before that, this is oh. about Motown Philly. Oh, 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 I said, you, oh, no, don't do that to me, man. Are you, you know, I, I got to sound better. I can't let people like Teddy hear it. It don't sound good, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, he was like, nope, these roughs, are, this is it. I think we mash, we, we're going with the roughs. Yeah. And wow. I didn't want to listen to the record when it came out. So how much control of, are you there for the, even for, not piecemeal records, but, okay, so, and I'm like Crazy Sexy Cool, which obviously is, you know, there's multiple producers. Multiple producers. Yeah. Um but who's the alpha producer? Are you there doing the mastering and the sequencing as well? Yeah. So, okay, please answer me this question. And, you know, we've asked Jimmy Jam this question. Um, we even asked, uh, who else started their uh, album with uh, a ballot first that we got on this? Um, <sighs> we, recently on the that. show, a super producer. But... Wait, for so the you know what's crazy though the boy uh, when it got too crazy sexy cool by that time, like when I was doing the uh, we want a TLC tip record, and uh, you just capture you know m records are you capturing a moment that just happened to you you recorded right. you recorded an event that just happened to you that's why they call it a record right so we were just whatever we were doing you know we acted it out we were just at the studio twenty four seven mm -hmm. recording it right so that album came out to be more cohesive as like okay you can tell that that's mm -hmm. kind of what happened somebody had to. The same person kind of did it all. By the time we got to Crazy Sexy Cool and the girl sold all those records mm -hmm. and all the madness had happened, then L.A. and them, you know, want to come in and say, okay, now, now they got let, us, let us go situate, let us bring in, let us do this. Let us. Right. And it wasn't until, and I was, I was like, weird on that because I would go, they would go say, yo, you start the project because you know what to do. And then we'll come in and fill in the blanks and bring in stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So, or I would go and say, okay, here's four, here's four or five songs. Let me find the other ones that'll fit in from Babyface or from this person or that person, right? By the time we got the Crazy Sexy Cool, it was like L.A. was trying to make, I think, sure that they didn't fail in that sense. So it was like song, 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 right? But by the time, and, and then he wasn't going to put Creep out. He shot the video. We've heard, we heard he shot three videos. He shot three, yeah. shot three videos, yeah. And then um, he wasn't going to put it out. And so then he went to Clive and said that. And Clive was like, he, Clive called me. He's like, nope, L.A.'s wrong. He's like, <laughs> and this is the first time I've ever heard this thing. He goes, and that Miles Davis horn sound you have in there is going to get you a Grammy. And I was like, what wow. Miles Davis wow. horn sound? And Creep? Yeah. I, I was, see? Uh -huh. So I was the same way, but that's, that's funny because that's how he interpreted it. But what I was doing is I had Creep up on my MPC 64 a week, right? right. Mm -hmm. I would come in and sing the song, burr, burr, not like, save it, yes. and just be like, oh, man, I think it sounds too country. And that's, but what? I, what? Keep it on the down low. No, but I'm like, well, <laughs> but I kept singing it every day. So I was like, you know what? Let me just get Deborah Killens to come do the demo so I can get it out of my head, right? Mm -hmm. So I wrote the whole song, had her come sing it, and I couldn't find a cymbal crash that I liked. So I was just went, oh, brr, brr, brr. I put this in because, like, you know, Pete Rock and everybody would put the right. horns on the one. Right, right, right. 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 So I, I found that and put it in there and didn't think of it as anything that would be a signature. It was just like, hey, this is the horn hit on the one. But Clive was like, that Miles Davis horn sound is going to get you a Grammy. And I was like, what Miles Davis horn sound? Miles Davis horn sound. <laughs> and it's not even Miles well, it's not Davis. That, but just like the, the sound of it. I know it's idea. not his. Yeah. That mean, was the closest thing that, that Clive could right, identify. Right, could relate to. It, yeah, I was going to say, even to this day, when Creep is still like maybe the first 20 records that I spend when I do DJ gigs. Thanks. And when it comes in, it's, it's almost the effect. And it's weird because like that record used to be Troy. Like whenever you spend the top of yeah 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 they reminisce over you yep. place goes pandemonium right. and then you know after fifteen twenty years then yeah silence it ain't gonna save you no more yeah the generational yeah, yeah. change but creep has never lost its luster it gives Wait, you a chance to get on the floor the first fifteen thirty seconds they give you a chance to get on the floor and then you can really Put your get drink it down. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah but yeah, just yeah. when people hear it, 
yeah. it's almost yeah. like I hear the screams of when I was 14 years old in ninth grade. Like that's <laughs> that's what, that's the, the yells I hear. Wait, so at the time when I was I, we were living in London when Crazy Sexy Cool came out, there was this white singer that did Texas. Charlene Spiteri, right? Yo, I, I was like, is it me or is she pulling <laughs> she the Jermaine? Song? Oh yeah, uh, give they, me give me another non Jermaine kind a, of like uh, yeah. a person. Raphael's, you know, okay, like yeah, when yeah, the song yeah. comes out. Yeah, yeah. If you like white diamonds, you'll you like, like this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was it me or when you when I heard that song, <laughs> we we be in the tour bus like it would come on MTV or whatever, and I was like, yo, this is the this that, is creep. That is creep. And they came. My my, my publisher called me and said, yo. So I always it's this to know. group Texas, and yes. they've done this song called "Once in a Lifetime." Once in a lifetime. lifetime. Yep. And you ever I heard don't know. It? So, and so they 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 played the song for me, and they said you got two choices. They said, well, they actually bid it because they really really like you, mm. and they wanted a song to sound like yours. So either you could sue them for that, or you could work with them. I said, well, why don't you I work, work with them? That's the Dallas way. And I, I worked with them. I did so millions of records with them on the song I did with them called Long "In Demand." Like. Years after it, yo man, I've been for twenty years trying to figure out. They ran it. They ran that joint in Europe forever, yep. and then I just stopped hearing it. But I always wanted to know if it was that. I mean, that always happens in songwriting. Like even to this day, like I always use the example on on the original reels of Fleetwood Mac's Dreams. Yep, it still says the Spinners' idea number three because they were making "I'll Be Around." I'll be around. Yep. And Stevie and Nicks was doing what she's doing. Uh, Stab actually doing a little red Corvette. Yeah, exactly. You know, and got him to come in and. Yeah, because then you you would. That's kind of how they would look at stuff. You know, you only got this many notes. Right? It's twelve notes in there. Right. So that's got to make everything you've ever heard in your life. All the jazz, all the classical, wow. all the hip hop, all wow. the R and B, all the pop is made it. between here and here. That's all. And that's what's so genius about music because manipulation, and, and, and you're gonna run across it again. It's just impossible not to. And that's why every reggae song gonna sound pretty much Man, alike. And that's why you know we had the thing with, for, uh, with yeah. Pharrell and them talking about blurred lines. But <sighs> it's like you're starting to run out of even, even you're starting to run out of combinations. Combinations, right. yeah. Right. We I, we rabbit holed into that the the question I had about sequencing an album is when you're sequencing. Cooley High Harmony, the album, I always want to ask producers, whoever the executive producer is, like, how much balls do you have to start an album off with a ballad? That, you know, when... That, yeah, especially when you have Motown, Motown Philly in your pocket. Okay. And yes, yeah. I see Motown, I do see Motown Philly as a side to yeah, adrenaline right. banger yeah. thing. But y'all didn't once say, like, maybe we should start this record with... Motown Philly? Man, please don't go. That's no, that jam. Yeah, 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 and under right. pressure and like it was Zimpin, we were kind of like. trying to, you know, I would I would sequence records like this most of the time where I would say, okay, well, you, you want to just have the mood right. So I don't want to have a fast song, slow song, fast song, slow song. You want to have like, here's your fast, here's your mids, and then slow it down towards the, kind of towards the end of it. Um, when they did Crazy Sexy Cool, obviously that was L.A. Right. Um and I was, I, I felt a little more disconnected from Crazy Sexy Cool than the first one, uh, um, just because it, it felt to me patched up, not patched up, but it felt like a bunch of different Even with the interludes, with sort of? That was supposed to be the thing that tied it together, but- the Who did those interludes? Different people, like- Not you? To do something, nah. Oh, damn, I thought uh, it was you. Um, but it was just because at a, at a certain point, I did all, all, you know, you go in, you start off, and you do all these songs, and then you start to say, okay, and then he starts to say, okay, well, now I'm going to put this person in. Now I'm going to put that person in. Now we're going to let somebody listen to all your mm -hmm. stuff, and then we're going to put somebody else in to try to do better than yours. And we had this thing before me organizing and Jermaine. Um, we, we've known each other since the skating rinks, so mm -hmm. since we were like 16, we're since I first out. got to Atlanta, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and me and JD used to go over his, his house with his mom, and make beats on Jermaine's MPC, and his mom would you know, feed us Teddy Grahams or Kool-Aid or whatever. <laughs> um, and nice combo. so we would just be like, yeah, we, you know, <laughs> that's just what we were doing. We were young and not just in high school and all this, and didn't really, you know, we're dressing the kids at the mall and kind of just doing, you know, just having fun. Yeah. So we really didn't know and think about how it was gonna blow up. And myself, Rico, and Jermaine, we had, um, you know, after we started to come up, we ended up doing all, all the LaFace records. Mm -hmm. That was all the records right That's there, true. me, Jermaine, and Rico. I did not think yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah. At was one that, point, was Highland Place Mops was that, that was the yep. yeah that was all yeah. 
And so at one point I hit, I hit. Uh, we had all got way off track. Like we wasn't messing with each other. We was just like way off track. When like, did it get competitive? It got competitive like at Crazy Sex after Crazy Sex. I was going to ask, how did you feel about Waterfalls? Because even Ellie said himself, like he saved organized noise for last. Well, I loved I loved Waterfalls. See, I knew all of them. These are like all my guys in the first place because we all hung out at the skating rink and stuff together before LA even knew any of us. Mm -hmm. So we felt like when LA kind of came to town, he was the opportunity. But we was more crazy about Babyface, you know. But we couldn't really access. He made the music. Yeah, yeah, we couldn't really access Face like that. It was like LA came to the forefront and was like, hey. Um, and so, by the time we got the crazy, sexy, cool, we realized. I, was, I called him one day and I said, "Yo, man!" And we had all this ABC crisscross beef and all that stuff when he was kids, yeah, and yeah, nah, it just turned it. into a bunch of mess in the first place. But um, I called Jermaine and one day and said, "Yo, man, you know we need to have a meeting. Um, you and Rico come meet me at this restaurant and don't bring any security." What you mean? Don't bring no security. <laughs> Set up. <laughs> I was like, I can't find my noise. Se <laughs> we don't need security. We've been knowing each other since high school, but we've been way off. Yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah, since everybody then. done made money and went on their own thing. Put Atlanta back on the so map. So we had a meeting with him, and I said, uh, I, said I had to. Sorry, you, you, you gonna like this one? So I said to him, I said, Yo, man, you, what's going on with us? Like, you ever noticed that we all work on the face records, but we don't work on any of our own records together? Mm. Like, you never worked this was before before Jermaine did first night. I said, you never worked on Monica. I was about to ask I you. I never worked on Escape. Right. You never worked on working. Uh, something. What's going on? So, <laughs> so Jermaine goes, well, oh, L.A. said, man, you don't really like my stuff. And I said, well, damn, L.A. told me you don't like my stuff. Oh, and then Rico Wade goes, well, L.A. told me that neither one of y'all like my stuff. Oh, <laughs> shit. So, he admitted that. And so, he admitted that he wanted friction between the three of you, so that way you'd be competitive. You'd be competitive. And so he gave us the book for Christmas, The Art of War, and none of us have paid attention to it. Yeah. <laughs> Or y'all would have said this nigga gave us the book. <laughs> we yeah. pulled on us in the first place, and so we from that point was like, okay, we gotta stop because Atlanta's small, and, yeah. and for us to be separated and we're the glue to the whole thing is like that didn't make any sense oh, because yeah. we don't function like that down here. So right. is that was when the Monica relationship started? That's when the Monica yes. relationship started okay. the first night. Okay, okay. So you, I'm waiting for that time. I'm waiting we, for that conversation. We're gonna bring it up, but okay. you, there's one thing that we just could skip over. Uh, for those of us that aren't uh, Atlanta adjacent, and I know that your connection to the ATL film, um, could you explain to us outsiders about skate culture in Atlanta and how <laughs> important it is or the epicenter? Oh, man. It was the only other outlet. You know, so when I did, I did Drumline first, right? And mm -hmm. everybody kind of said, okay, it brought the marching bands to the forefront. And then I had ATL. It was called Jelly Beans. I had that movie at the same time, and um, it was – based out because the skate rink was called Jelly Beans that me and t Boz and um, Organized Noise and Divine Stevens and all of us went to the skate rink every Sunday. You still skate? And Yeah. What's up? So what the trip is is then after I did Drumline, um, Fox was like, okay, he's got the skate rink movie so we're going to put out Roll Bounce because I took, uh, I, I, oh. so I take, I had taken the other movie to Warner Brothers and um, and so then when they put out Roll Bounce, Warner called me and was like, yo, um, we can't make a skate rink movie. They just put that one out. That's not going to make sense. Oh, ACL is old. So it was a, yo, oh yeah. So then, so but I looked at it, I said, well, look, man, that's a period piece. I was like, that's like watching the wood. Like, yeah, this it is. is. I yeah. said, but right. we're doing this now in Atlanta. Right now, today on Sundays, they are skating. Does it still happen? And they're skating. Yeah, right now. Okay. It was like, we and Usher, me, Usher, Skates and Jermaine are back still going. crazy yeah. anyway. Me, Usher, that's Jermaine why Usher's so going. good. He got it from me and, J me and Jermaine. He didn't change that. LA in that way. He go to the Usher's skate like out there. Ty Babylonian Randy Gartner on his IG, yo. Like, I was like, yo, I didn't know you were that good. <laughs> Ty Babylonian, you better bring it back. <laughs> that's all I know. That's the last skaters I know. <laughs> but right like now, Debbie, what's her name? If you go to Cascade on Sundays or you go yes, to the spot, or, or Jermaine will call me and be like, yo, Sunday, what you doing? Let's go skating. Oh, I can see wow. Jermaine skating Still with right his now. hand on somebody's back. Like, oh, yeah, doing we the joint, yo. And we went to New York for the for the for Flippers. Right, because right. Jimmy Iovine and them are opening um, the skate rink to Flippers again. Thirty Rock, yeah. Yes, we went to New York for that, but yeah, the skate culture here has always been super strong. It's still, and when I did ATL, the crazy part about it is I went and got the same guys that, that I was skating with because they still skating. Yeah. Wow. So all those dudes in the movie, they still like Cascade. They still skating. That's so the authentic like, Atlanta. That's it. Now, do you skate? Board as well, or is it like is there a skate culture we were skating, as well? Skateboarding more when we was younger, yeah. but then once we started getting to the, because our skate culture here is so competitive, 
like once we have our like ten people in the line and you know. And, oh y'all really? Hey, hey, hey get that shit out the hit way. Him, hit himself on the bus <laughs> to get out the <laughs> way. But, but oh, why yeah, yeah, yeah. does the express line have to be the outer line? <laughs> right, <laughs> like, that's a good question. I mean, what about geriatric <laughs> skating? So I can <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> and, and, and it be going so fast. Like once you get going, you don't realize how fast you're really going. I love it. And I'm, if you fall, like all the people in your line, they're gonna get it. So like it's, yeah. it, it becomes really intense. It's like, like driving. Wait, you open the door though. That's you open the drum line door. So you told one story about one movie. Can yeah. you got to tell us a little something that we don't know about this movie and the fact that why did you choose that era of your life? Because what we know right now is you got a couple of movies about three or five <laughs> right. yeah. of your life. So please. Well, it was it was when I first pitched Drumline. I was in a meeting with Fox and they were asking me about musicals. Like, hey man, we need to we're trying to find a way to do cool musicals again. And then I, I said, well, you can't break out doing singing in the rain. That ain't gonna happen. You need an excuse like a, a marching band. Right. And there was like a marching band. What's interesting about that? And in the meeting, I was like, "Oh, it's about this kid that can't read music, and he's in his marching band." And so I kind of pitched the whole my story to them in the meeting. And then a couple of days later, they called back and said, "We want to make this film." Right. And I said, "All right, cool." So we started making it. We started like developing it. And by the time the script got to a point where it was done, it was written by this girl Sean Sheps at first, but she just did Bring It On too or something. Oh, wow. And so when they wrote it, I was like, oh, "I was like, oh no, this ain't it. Yeah, this ain't it." And then they um and so Fox was like, Oh, that's not it. Okay, well we're gonna put it in, you know, we're gonna sit it over here then and let it just sit. And I'm like, No, well, we'll give it back to me. Yeah. They said, No, 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 we don't we can't give it back to you, you know, <laughs> because we bought it and they don't wanna make it, but they don't want nobody else to make it either. Because it does, if that happens, then it doesn't look right, right? So now the movie's sitting. You mean if it gets successful, then... Not through them. Not, right. not through them. Yeah. Like, like yeah. sitting on an artist, right? Yeah, I guess. so they have so many movies they put in turnaround where they just sit. And then later on, they'll go back and go, oh, you know what? We got one of those somewhere, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, um, <laughs> it was sitting, and it was sitting, and I was like, I got to get my movie back. So I called Quincy Jones. And I said, yo, man, one, one of the things Quincy showed me before was um, I was at his house one time, and he, he goes, uh, um, like not long before this conversation, and he goes, Dallas, look at um, look at this video. So I look at the video, and it's, it's Oprah, Danny Glover, and they look busted. Like, they just got off the bus at the West End Mall. They got on green. <laughs> <and> <laughs> the <laughs> West End Mall. I mean, it looked, like, rough. <laughs> and they're in this, like, high school theater, and they're rehearsing lines for the color purple. And oh, wow. so, and you can see the, the, the VHS tape at the bottom that and stuff. Dope. So he's going on. He said, so let me ask you a question. He said, who's holding the camera? I said, you are. Mm -hmm. I said, nope. Steven Spielberg. I said, he's holding the camcorder? He said, yeah. He said, because I needed a scene, a train scene. It was going to cost me more than $13 million to make the movie. And they, they were saying that black movies don't go over $70 million, So they wasn't going to give it to me. So I, I went and got my friend Steven. And I said, okay, Steven, you direct this for me? He said, yeah. He said, okay. So that turned everything around. I said, oh, that's why Steven, I never understood Steven Spielberg yeah, directing direct the Color Purple. Ah, me so he goes, this one, he said, this is what I'm going to tell you. You want to get that movie made? Find a friend of yours that's Jewish. Uh, well, we that's wow. done. So that was his. That was his. So check out what I did. I called Jody Gerson, that yeah. EMI publishing. Right. Yeah. She's my publisher at the time. So I said, Jody, when she said I need to find somebody Jewish, you're my <laughs> you're my closest Jewish friend. How do I get this movie made? She goes, Okay, can I come on as a producer? I said, Yeah. She said, Cool, because I'm gonna bring in my other friend, Wendy Feinerman. I said, who's right. that? She said, well, she just finished Forrest Gump and Cast Away. Shit. Double shit. The said, look, yeah. look, yeah. Sold. Well, I, so I walked back in Fox years later. I was trying to talk them out of the movie. I said, yo, no, so I want to get this movie back because I was going to take it somewhere else. Said, but, you know, um, she, uh, but Wendy Feinerman is going to work on it with me. They said, what? They said, hold on. The you Wendy got Feinerman. Wendy Feinerman to work on this this marching band movie? Just I'm, black? I'm like, yeah. Marching band she movie? said, okay, well, I'm going to tell you like this. Uh, can it take place in college? I said, it's bigger in college than, than in high school. She said, okay, we got to make this movie. I said, I was trying to talk y'all out of it. She said, no, no, we got to make this movie. I was like, oh, it's just hip-hop kid, can't read music. So they just said, you got to make it. So Wendy was like, all right, I have no idea what this is about. I'm just going to forge you off. I'm probably going to make a lot of money, and you're not, if it's successful. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to make it so you can make the movie exactly how you want to make it. And so when I came back to Atlanta, and I was in Miami during that time. I had moved and started doing Blue Cantrell and Pink oh, and Black yes, and all this yes, stuff yes. out of Miami. Um, when I came back, and Charlotte was like, yo, you got to come back. They're scouting for Drumline, and they need you here to, for locations and all this and that. So then it started to turn real. And I'm like, all right, this is a this is about you know I'm looking at Orlando Jones and Jamie Fox and different people for the Dr. Lee Dr. and Lee, yeah. and as we were starting to get get going and it started to really turn into the movie and the script and stuff started to get developed the right way. But then Tina Chisholm, who um, she's incredible, and she kind of like you know from that point she knew how to tell my stories because she would be around me all the time, 
So we went back, started shooting a movie here. Everybody I called to, to all the rappers, like, nope. I'm they like, said, nope. A, a movie about a band? I called Luda. I called everybody. Yo, yo, I need this part. I need a rapper for this field. And they, I think they thought I was doing I Got the Hookup. That's how you got Petey Pablo? That's how I got Petey Pablo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Luda, said, who, who was your initial asks? It was Luda, was, Luda was first. Uh, who else was around here then? Um, it's like two more Atlanta, you know, like, I think it was Outkast. Like I know they regret yeah. that shit now. Uh, but nobody knew the magnitude because, you know, in all fairness, nobody had seen anything like it right. you know, right. no, to hit Atlanta. And so then as I'm making the movie, it got to a point where it started to go over budget because obviously I'm recording 300-piece marching bands that I have to use for playback. So I got to record them first, write the songs like they're out now, record them on the marching band so you can use it for playback at the field, right? Mm -hmm. Started going over budget. So then Fox call. They say, yo... This movie's turning into a $18 million movie mm -hmm. instead of a 15, 13. Put right. white people in it. We need white bands. I'm wow. like, white bands? White bands? They don't, I was they like, hold on, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah. They don't do that. They do. So he's like, I don't care. It's a pop movie now. White bands. Mm -hmm. So now I got to go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> so I got Georgia State, Georgia Tech, and they just like. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, dude, and this, I can't put this. This looks horrible. I can't put this in the movie. Already, the bands don't want to be in the movie because they don't want to lose. Like, Yo, fam shout you. out right. to Fam You. Fam You. And our film our, crew. Our, our film crew is all Fam You. Yeah, well, <laughs> yo, Fam You was not going into the line because they was like, we're not losing to nobody. Yeah. We was like, so we, that's we, true. We, so okay. Well, that's why we're making whatever. a fake band because we don't want anybody's band to lose to anybody. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They said, nope. <laughs> we don't care if it's a fake band. Even we hypothetically, <laughs> with another title, they didn't <laughs> want it. <laughs> they just didn't want to have Fam You losing to. Uh, North Atlanta A and T, which ain't even a school. Yeah, ain't even a school. <laughs> so it had A and T's colors, but it wasn't, you know. Yeah, yeah. man. But when and but so I, I put the white bands in, and then at the end I looked. I said, "This is horrible. This is making these schools look really bad." And that's not what they're supposed to do either. So I said, "You got to find some kind of narrative line." And so I went, "How am I going to do this?" So I went to uh, I went to the school, Morris Brown, and I saw this white kid in okay, the band. Okay, that was Morris Brown. Okay, uh huh. So this white kid in the band with red hair, <laughs> and I was like. So how did you get here? What's your, tell me your story. He was like, man, I live down the street. I always wanted to be in this band since I was little. I was like, okay, there we go. We, yeah. got, we got a catch now. Yeah. And then by, by the time I edited the movie and took all the white bands out, then you know, you look on the DVD, it's still got the white bands in there. For like, mm -hmm. <laughs> they call them white bands because it's all white. <laughs> and you look at Georgia Tech or Georgia, yeah. you know. Um, but then the, the great part about it was, you know, seeing when, when Drumline, when I finally got it right, because um, I always said it didn't belong to me. It belongs to everybody in the band. I'm telling my story, but if I don't tell it like it is. It's a real culture. Is, oh, it's such a I gotta culture. Get, I got to get it right. I got to hit it on the head, and it's right. If I get it wrong, it's just no, right? And so when it when it when um, on the release date, I would go around to the theaters and see them sold out in Atlanta, and everybody would be in marching band outfits. Wow. Okay. And me and my like mom the, would just ride around being like, dang. And it took me 10 years, 10 years of every day making that film. And then um, because I wanted to do ATL next, they tried to get me to go to New Orleans, and so I ended up bringing the New Orleans bill to Atlanta and passing the film bill here. Uh, oh. So that's got why okay. Okay. that's how that's the film why bill got people passed. come to shoot in Atlanta. Yeah. Does Tyler Perry thank I, you? Oh, all of it. It cost me like two hundred grand passing that bill back then. I had to do <laughs> lobbying. I had so to you're do the that. reason oh, why wow. the Georgia logo comes on damn near every uh, everything. Yeah. The peach. Yeah. Wow. wow. But we didn't know. I was just trying to get ATL done back then, and so Governor Purdue. Um, he he basically said, okay, well, I don't know what to do. You tell us what to do. And we kind of came up with the plan that's the Georgia Film Bill now and did the ribbon cutting, spoke at the G8 Summit and all that stuff um, on behalf of Georgia so we can have what we have now going on. Hey, y'all, it's Lai here from Team Supreme. Okay, so right here is where we're going to end part one of the Quest Love Supreme with Dallas Austin. You're going to want to stay tuned for part two because this is when Dallas talks about working with Michael Jackson and Madonna and he tells some really dope stories about the group Illegal and producing Must Be the Money for Deion Sanders. Remember that? <laughs> this was like one of our favorite episodes. And don't forget, we are actually, we were actually live in Atlanta for this. So make sure you check out part two when it becomes available. See y'all.